Okay, so um, like I said, this passage contains a set of instructions for the church, what we're supposed to be up to, called the Great Commission. The instructions are found uh, beginning in verse 19, which is where I'll start. Uh, this is what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be up to. Uh, these are the words from which our congregation draws its identity and its mission. Uh, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So these are the instructions. Uh, go, make disciples, baptize, teach. Um, before we hear those words and that instruction, I think it's very important that you understand the context of these set of instructions. And for that reason, uh, although we're really concerned uh, beginning in verse 16, I'd like to start in verse 11. Because what I want you to see is that even before Jesus gave these instructions to the church, there was a context. And the context is very important and very helpful so that we understand rightly how to go about this mission and this ministry that we've been given. And particularly beginning in verse 11, what I want you to see is that before Jesus ever gave these instructions to the church, there was, there was before the, the commission ever happened, there was a very, I guess from a worldly point of view, powerful counter mission that uh, was waged, and, and I would argue is still at work in this world today. So let's start reading at verse 11 here for context purposes. Chapter 28, the first 10 verses detail the resurrection of Jesus, that an angel came down, that the stone was rolled away, that Jesus was no longer there, that he was risen, how the women who had come to the tomb actually saw him and he appeared to them. And okay, beginning in verse 11, it says this, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. This report gets to the governor. We will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble." So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Here's what I want, to, want you to see as we look at these verses, that um, there really was, I guess at least from a worldly point of view, a very powerful counter mission to the Christian mission that got started long before Jesus gave his instructions to the church. And it really had everything you could want if you were going to start a movement. Uh, the first thing it had, and I'll show you four things it had. The first thing it had was money. So if you look with me at verse 12, it says, When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. Then if you look at verse 15, it says, So the soldiers took the money, and they did as they were instructed. Now, um, I think this is important. Uh, what is it that, that still motivates the world today? Uh, it's no, no surprise, right? We're motivated by what? Money. I mean, money gets people up in the morning. It, it's what they lay down to thinking at night. Money moves this world. And I want you to say that this counter mission, uh, this mission against Christianity, was very well funded. It had a lot of resources. And um, I mean... Okay, especially compared to the disciples, which are dirt poor and had nothing. Uh, this was a very well-funded mission, this counter-mission, money. The second thing it had, leadership and power. So verse 11 talks about how the guards went and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. Verse 12 says the chief priests met with the elders, and they devised this plan. And so we've got the chief priests, we've got the elders. Who are they? They're the leaders of people. They are the educated. They were the charismatic. They were the ones who people look to for guidance. Uh, they were the ones. Uh, I mean, the best that this culture and society had to offer. These were the chief priests and the elders. And, and I want you to see this as well, verse 14. If this report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Um, political power. So the soldiers, uh, they're supposed to go and tell a story that they fell asleep. Now listen, uh, this is no secret. If you're a soldier, you've been given a job to do, stand guard here, uh, keep post. And 
and you fall asleep on the job, and the very thing that you were you know, commissioned to do, you failed, what's going to happen to you? I mean, trouble, right? And especially in Roman society, it, it just was the case. If you were a Roman soldier and you'd been given this job to, to guard this tomb, I mean, it was probably for you the death penalty. But um, what do they have? They have political clout. They have power. The chief priests, the elders, they gather together. They're the leaders of all the people. They're the charismatic people. They're the educated. They're the well-connected. And they say, listen, um, we've got some power. We've got some connections that uh, if you start to get in any trouble with the story, we'll smooth it all over. Listen, if you're going to start a movement, what do you want? You want those kind of people, people who are connected, people who can get things done, people who make things happen. So they had money. They had the powerful leaders who are well-connected, politics. Uh, the third thing they had, and we should really talk about this one, they had what I'll just call a really believable story, reason logic, rationality. Here's what I mean, verse 13. This is the instruction. They say to the guards, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were asleep. Now, um, okay, there are two different stories that are going to move forward. Let me tell you what they are. Story number one, uh, guards at night fall asleep. Disciples, who already are known as troublemakers, come and steal the body. They're up to something. And uh, that's what happened. That's one version of the story. There's another version of the story. The other version of the story says something like this. Angels, spiritual forces, a huge rock rolled away, dead body gone, dead person resurrected from the dead, and you should give your life to him. Now listen. Listen. Um, it's not lost on me. I mean, I stand up every single week and try to convince you that you should give your life to this person who was hung on a cross uh, like a criminal. Uh, and I try to tell you, listen, he, he is alive. He's raised from the dead. And I understand what an uphill battle I have. Because the first story makes so much more sense. I mean, a guard fell asleep at night. The disciples who were troublemakers, they came and stole the body. Um, Logic, reason, rationality. Um, okay, what do they have? They have money. They have the right leadership, political power. They're well connected. They have, at least on the face of it, a much more believable story. And uh, finally, the fourth thing I'll point out to you, it's as simple as this, a head start. A head start means a lot, and if you look at verse 15 at the very end, it says this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. I mean, listen, uh, what is the power of first impressions? You know, I mean, it's almost impossible. Once you have that first impression, to change someone's mind is very difficult. Uh, before Jesus ever got around to telling his disciples, okay, here's the mission I want you to have, here's what I want you to go and do, I want you to say that there was a powerful countermission. It, it was well-funded. It had the right kind of people with the right kind of politics and power. It was imminently way more logical, rational, believable, and it had a head start. Okay, if that weren't enough, now I'm going to add to it by contrasting the contrast, uh, uh, the context of this great commission. Look with me beginning in verse 16. Verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples stop." Wait a second, how many disciples are there supposed to be? You all know that somehow. There's there's supposed to be 12 disciples. Jesus chose 12. Why 12? There were 12 tribes of Israel. 12 is a very complete number. I mean, when you go buy a a dozen of something, how many do you want? I mean, we all reckon that's a complete number. There are 11. They're short. Why? Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus, had committed suicide. Um, Now there's only 11 This is a group of people who are running on, maybe I can put it this way, only 11 out of 12 cylinders. I mean, they're they're hobbling along. In fact, um, we'll see this because later on this year we're going to get into the book of Acts. The early church felt the weight of this. One of the very first actions of the disciples say, listen, we can't stay 11. We've got to have a 12th. And so actually the 11, they got together and they chose another person to be the 12th apostle. I mean... 
Here's what I want you to say. This isn't a full group. They're, they're just hobbling along. They're, they're running on 11 out of 12 cylinders. And, and now, here we go. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Um, you know the instruction that Jesus is going to give. Therefore, go to all nations. He's going to say, hey, go take over the world. Um, just imagine, you want to start something that takes over the world. Um, are these disciples who you want? They're not leaders, they're uneducated fishermen. Okay, but, but they're passionate about their faith. They're sure of their convictions. Uh, <laughs> no, not even that. In fact, uh, here we are, we're sitting here, and, and some of us, I mean, we have faith, but it's the kind of faith where we also have doubts. We're not that much different. Here's what we say to ourselves. Well, I'll tell you what would solve my doubts. If I could see Jesus face to face, then I'd be certain. Then I would no longer have doubts. If I could put my, hand, my finger in his hands, you know, touch the scars, then okay, then, then I'd get sure and I'd get certain. Man, here are these disciples standing face to face with him. They're worshiping, but, but they're, they're, they're what? They're, they're doubting. So now just compare the two groups. A well-funded group with political power, with savvy, that uh, has a more believable story and a head start, or a ragtag group of uneducated fishermen who aren't even a full group, and they're not even sure of their convictions. Okay, who, forget about the fact that this is a great commission. Who's going to win? I mean, we all make our judgment. Of course, normally, it, it, it's the counter mission that's going to win, but all right, there's no secret. I mean, it's not just this group. Millions of Christians all over the world and every nation are gathering together to worship the name of Jesus this morning. Why? How'd that happen? Um, and I think this is really important because you've, you've got to see here the, the unbelievable, comprehensive nature of what it was that Jesus was going to ask. I mean, he didn't just say, go do a little thing. He went and said, go do a huge thing. Um, actually, one of the most important words in the Great Commission, it's a very short word, both in English and in Greek, it's just three letters, it's the word all. And you find the word all three times in just these couple of verses. Uh, I'll point them out to you. Verse 18, when Jesus first speaks, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Then he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of really the name of all of God, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, literally in Greek, all I have commanded you, and surely I am with you, literally in Greek, all the days to the very end of the age. I want you to see the, the wide scope, the comprehensive nature of what these 11 doubting disciples were asked to do. I mean, go to all nations, make disciples of all people. Huge task for a ragtag group running on 11 out of 12 cylinders, a doubting group. Huge task. So, given the two, what made the difference? And uh, I want you to see that there's a statement before the instructions and a statement after the instructions. Here's a statement before, verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm totally in charge. All of history, every circumstance, everything that happens in your life, whether big or small, I am totally in charge. I'm commanding every incident. I'm commanding every circumstance. There's nothing happening apart from my will. Every person, every conversation, every thought, I'm in charge. That's the first statement. Then there's a statement after the instructions. It's in the middle of verse 20. Jesus says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What's he saying? He's saying, there'll never be a time where I leave or forsake you. 
no matter what you're going through, no matter what life spits at you, no matter what circumstances you face, no matter what obstacles are in your way, my power is there. I'm there. I'm with you. I'm a resource you can always draw off of, rely on. I'm a power that fuels your life. I will always be there. And um, as we speak those words, I just want to point out to you how totally countercultural this is for us. I mean, the message that you find here is it goes totally against the grain of what our culture says. Let me try to name it for you. Here's what our culture says. Our culture says, listen, uh, the problems in this life are mainly external that are out there, but you have the power somewhere deep down inside of you. You have the strength. You have the resources. And you may not see it at first, but if you just scratch it a little further, if you dig a little deeper, you will see you can do it. That's what our culture says. I mean, it says it in every day. We, we teach it to kids in school. We speak it in every form of media. Uh, the problems are basically out there. Uh, but inside, you've just got to believe in yourself. You have what it takes. Okay, that's what our culture says. Um, the Bible says almost the exact opposite. Um, Jesus' message is it couldn't be more diametrically opposed. Are, are you ready for it? Here's Jesus' message. The problems are mainly in here. You are inherently weak. You are inherently sinful. You, you inherently lack faith. The problems are, are mainly in here. Yes, there are problems out there, but, but mainly they're in here. You don't have what it takes. However, there is an external power and authority and presence which can come into your life and change you from the inside out. You don't have what it takes inside, but, but there is this external power which can totally take over and, and win the day for you. Um, those are, are totally diametrically opposed ideas. And um, I'd really like you to consider which one is true today. Is it true that the problems are mainly out there, but I do have what it takes? Or is the message of the Bible right? The main problem is in here, and I really don't have what it takes. However, there is a power out there that is being offered to me that if I connect my life to it, will, will make every difference in the world. And I'd suggest to you that the reason there are millions and millions of people gathered together today to worship the name of Jesus had nothing to do with anything inherently strong down deep in these 11 doubting disciples. But Jesus' words, he's totally in charge. He's in control of everything. He's the power overseeing everything. And he is with us if we belong to him no matter what. Okay, that's the context. Let's get into the words of what the church is supposed to do. Verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. For long now, Sunlight Community Church has said, okay, this is what Jesus told the church to do. We don't have to try and improve on it. We just really need to think, what is it that he's calling us to do in these words? And as we have really wrestled with and thought over these words, that there are three things we, we think this passage is teaching. And, and so therefore, our mission statement is, is said like this. Sunlight Community Church is number one, rooted in the gospel. Number two, growing disciples. Number three, planting churches. And I like to talk about all three of those today because they're at the heart of what we do here every single week. They, they fuel our total vision, our direction, our ministry, our mission, and each one of our lives. Uh, let's take them one at a time. First, rooted in the gospel. So if you look at the specific wording, the very last phrase, and you find it in verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Um, Jesus is saying, listen, share my message. Share the message of Jesus Christ. What is the message of Jesus Christ? It's a message ultimately of good news. It's the message of the gospel. And week by week, if you come here to Sunlight, we, we share that message using three words, sin, salvation, service. Let's just rehearse those one more time. And I'd like to do it by actually talking about Jesus' words, what he taught, 
Um, his very first sermon, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, was a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's three chapters long, but I want to just work our way through it well, fairly quickly. All right, first, sin. Um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, these are the opening words of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, there, there it is. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, um, it's only those who will finally admit, I don't have what it takes. I'm, I'm spiritually poor. It's not like I, I can scrape a little deeper and find it. I, I don't have the resources. It's only those who, who will put their hand up and admit, I'm a guilty sinner. I have spiritual poverty. I have nothing inside of myself that can make myself acceptable to God. It's only those who will ever inherit the kingdom of God. And so one of the things we talk about is, listen, before you can ever receive the good news of the gospel, you have to first admit the problem is, is in here. And I don't have what it takes. I need an external power to come in and save me, which leads to the second word, salvation. As Jesus, the sermon goes forward, it's actually one of the most famous lines in the sermon in chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus says, for I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, unless you have such a pure and spotless life that the righteousness that's yours somehow surpasses that of, of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, and catch the strong wording here, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So don't say to yourself, well, I might be good enough. Uh, maybe I will. No, no, you will certainly not Let's talk about this. Uh, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, who were they? They were people who were absolutely devoted to the study of the law in the Old Testament. They made every effort with their life, with their speech, with their thought, to follow the Ten Commandments and all the, the related commandments with every fiber of their being, with every effort. I mean, they really tried hard, and yet Jesus, he says, listen, it's not enough. Uh, unless you're more righteous than them, uh, you don't stand a chance. Now, you may say to yourself, well, man, uh, where could I, how, how, how can anyone be saved then? And, and that's what Jesus' message and teaching is all about. Listen, here is what Jesus came to do. He came into this world, and he lived a life that had way more righteousness than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So you read about him. He was tempted in every way, yet he never sinned even one time. He, he loved in every circumstance. He never struck back when he was struck. He, he, never be, you know, he never did anything that even came close to sinning. He, he was a perfect, spotless, you know, totally righteous person. That's the first thing. He, he lived the life that we frankly can't. And um, then if you read about his life, his life ultimately, all four Gospels, the main part of the Gospels say this, that at the end of his life, he, he was abandoned, he was traded, and, and he was put there on the cross. And what happened at the cross is God took all our sin, he took it off us, and, and Jesus was punished in our place. In other words, he paid the penalty of every last one of our sins. The Bible says this, that not only are our sins totally paid for, but if we put our faith in Jesus, then he actually takes the righteousness of Jesus, the life we never lived, and he gives that righteousness to us. How can I have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers? I can't if I'm looking inside. Do I have what it takes? No, I, I'm spiritually poor. Until you admit you're spiritually poor, you'll never go looking for another righteousness. And the Bible makes this very clear. That there's a righteousness available in the person of Jesus. If you get connected to him by faith, God will give you that righteousness. That's salvation. You can, you can have that righteousness and enter the kingdom of heaven if by faith you connect yourself to Jesus. Now, service. This is how the Sermon on the Mount ends. Actually, as Jesus is ending the Sermon on the Mount, it's very famous. He says, listen, there's two ways. There's a wide way and there's a narrow way. Most people are on the wide way, but there's this narrow way. Only a few find it. He said there's two kinds of teachers. There's two kinds of teachings. 
He finally says there's two foundations. This is what he says. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. He then continues, he says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus is saying there's two ways to live, either wise or foolish. Here's what the foolish person does. They glibly go about building their life in a way that's thoughtless about the greater realities around them. What does he mean? Well, I think we know what he means. It's possible to just go about your life and not think about, is there a God? How do I relate to him? What's my purpose in life? I mean, people do this all the time. They just, they're kind of glibly going about their business. They're not thinking about the wider realities of life. They're not concerned about what's going to happen when the storms come and the rain falls. And listen, if up till now, no rain has fallen, no storms have come, uh, you've just lucked out. They will. And ultimately, I mean, the whole house is going to be tested. Your life is going to be tested. Don't just section that on. Oh, it'll never happen. Jesus says there's a wise way and there's a foolish way. The wise person thinks about the larger realities. And at Sunlight, that's basically what I'm standing here begging you to do every single week. Don't just glibly live your life in a non-thinking way, thinking to yourself, well, I'll just section that out, and well, whatever happens, happens. Jesus, as he concludes his sermon, he's saying, listen, there is a solid ground to stand on so that when all the chips are down and, and it's time, you'll be secure. And uh, what he says is, finally, the place to build that house is, is here on the righteousness of Jesus. Don't think to yourself, I have what it takes inside. You don't. Get what you need. Build somewhere strong. That's the message of the gospel. Build your life there. That's the first thing. And I guess as we speak about being rooted in the gospel, before I say anything else, if you're here today and you hear God in some way or another speaking to you and you're willing for the first time to consider, okay, what if there is a God and where do I stand with him? I just urge you, uh, there's something here that, uh, that is worth standing on that can save you in the end. Uh, just consider it. Rooted in the gospel. Number two, growing disciples. So if you look at verse 19, it's actually the main verb. Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples. Let's, let's talk about that. So let's talk about the ministry of Jesus. I would say about the ministry of Jesus that actually his ministry had the scope of the whole world in mind. You know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And, and Jesus came fully intending to save the entire world. But when he came here, I mean, he came to a specific place and a specific time, and um, he came, I guess, to a subset, and, and he gathered around him a crowd. Uh, the crowds at that time were very, very large. I mean, um, a couple weeks from now, we're going to be talking about the miracle of the feeding of 5,000. Probably that only counted the men at the time, so there could have, women and children included, there could have been a crowd of like 15,000 people. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, large crowds gathered. Jesus had a, a ministry to these crowds, but let me tell you something. The crowds were fickle. They came, they went, uh, they were intrigued by him, they were turned off by him. They were the ones who finally, you know, turned against him. Besides the crowd, Jesus actually, he had a group of people, I don't know what else to call them, so I call them the committed. Um, the women who first came to the tomb, they were part of this group. At one point, Jesus sends out 70 people uh, to go and preach in all the villages in town about the kingdom of heaven coming and being near. Uh, I would put the 70 people in this group. Uh, these were people who, who they were devoted to Jesus. They weren't fickle like the crowd. Uh, they were with him. But inside that group, there was a group, and um, they were just 12 in number. They were the disciples. And um, Jesus poured his entire life into the disciples. In fact, as you read about his life in, in this book, 
here's what would happen. He'd often, he'd be teaching crowds, and then he'd want to get away from the crowds. And he'd take the 12 with him, and um, he'd pull them aside, and he'd say, listen, uh, what I was saying back there, do you guys understand it? They'd say, no. He said, well, let me explain it to you. And he'd explain it to them. Um, there were times where he, he just got away, and they ate together, they slept together, they talked over. He just poured himself out to them, discipling and training them for what lie ahead, for the ministry that they would have. Um, it was very intimate. It was very personal. It was, it was face-to-face, if I can put it in those terms. And, and I might as well say this, that even among the disciples, there was even a smaller group, Peter, James, John, that Jesus he was even more intimate, more close with. They were his closest friends. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he went to pray, uh, the disciples came with him, but when they entered into the garden, he said, Peter, James, and John, come on, let's go. They, they were close. When he went up on the mountain of transfiguration, Peter, James, John, come on, let's, let's go. They got to see things. They got to hear things. They, they understood things that no one else got, even among the disciples. So now that I've said all that, okay, These 12 disciples who Jesus poured into, he gathers them together at the very end. And he says, okay, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And by the way, I'm going to be with with you always, no matter what. He says, therefore, go make disciples. When he said, go make disciples, what do those disciples hear? Did they hear, hey, listen, go gather a huge crowd I mean, by the way, the disciples did those kind of things, but no. What, what, did, what were they supposed to do? Uh, face-to-face, small group, one-on-one. And um, here's the thing I'd like to say. It's clear in this passage he commissions disciples to make disciples. What does that mean? What it means is that if you're a mature disciple of Jesus, what are you supposed to be doing? face-to-face, one-on-one, in small groups, pouring what you know into other people's lives. By the way, if you don't have that, a group of people, you'd say, okay, these are the people that I'm pouring into. Uh, Very unlikely that you're a mature disciple of Jesus. Mature disciples of Jesus are called to make disciples. And so one of the things disciples do is they pour into other disciples. Um, I think that's just bread and butter. And, and, And let me put it this way. So Billy Graham, many of you know him, he had these huge crusades, very large crusades. I mean, evangelistically, huge evangelist. Uh, You know what he said? He said, listen, the number one way people become Christians, one-on-one. There's a man who, huge crowds he'd gather, he said, the number one way people become Christians, one-on-one. And uh, our church is about that, about making disciples. If you're here, if you're... You're a committed Christian. If you're a disciple of Jesus, disciples make disciples. Um, We're going to talk about programs and ministries. Okay, those are all great. But at the bottom line, individual disciples of Jesus are making other disciples of Jesus. Does that make sense? That's really at the heart of our church. Number three, planting churches. So there's a phrase here, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Here it is, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And um, what Bible students have said is, listen, if you're baptizing someone, you're always baptizing them into the community of Jesus Christ, which means that, you know, the disciples were called to what? Make communities of, of followers of Jesus. Make churches, plant churches. And so when the apostles went out, what do you find them doing? In every city they go, they're, they're what? They're planting churches churches. And so we think this is at the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it's at the heart of our church's mission. We're rooted in the gospel, we're growing disciples, but we're, we're also called to plant churches. Now that we've gotten that far, I'd like to talk about how to do that in our particular setting. And I think this is important. If you're part of Sunlight, you just need to know that as we've wrestled through this, we've said, all right, in our location, in our, in our setting, this is how we're going to be about planting churches. There's, there's two different ways maybe that you can plant churches. One you might call the parachute drop model. Here's what it is. Uh, The plane flies over a city, Tallahassee, Kansas City, Indianapolis, wherever. Uh, The church planter who feels called by God to do this work jumps out of the plane, parachutes down. They don't know anyone there. 
but they have this burning passion to start a church, start gathering people, start a worship service. And, uh, okay, how difficult is that? I mean, just put yourself in their shoes. Uh, probably, usually there's a case, a denomination or a church sends them, they, they pay this person or, or funds their way for a few years, but a few years after that, you got to, how hard is that? Pretty hard. Pretty hard. And, and by the way, there, there are missionaries who this is what God calls them to do. And especially in places where Christianity is not there yet, um, there are brave missionaries who, who are called to, to go to those places and, and start something new. Um, the city of Fort St. Lucie is not like that. I mean, we've got boots on the ground. Here they are. And so there's another way to do this, and, and it's this, that a growing church um, sees the, the need in our community, and as it continues to grow, takes a group. In our case, what we really have a vision of doing is taking like 75 to 100, and, and we plant a daughter church. Our idea is this, that in a regular way, hopefully as often as possible, along with a trained and qualified church planting pastor, we are taking people from our congregation and sending them out, okay, you guys go take that part of the city. You guys go take that part of the city. And um, that's something we want to do as, as often as we possibly can with the idea that as that happens, then both those churches continue to grow to the point where we can do it again and do it again and do it again. And so, by the way, if you come to my new members class, uh, even over the last couple of years, I think I always have this line somewhere in it, and there's one this afternoon if you want to come. Um, I always say something like this, listen, we are so glad you're here, and one day we hope you'll leave. And we're serious about that, and I want you to think about that, everyone who's a member here. We're glad you're here, we hope you'll leave. Because we feel a responsibility to plant more churches in this city. It's just necessary as a part of our mission. Now, um, second part of the philosophy here. Uh, it is possible, uh, and a lot of churches do this every time you plant a new church, that that new church has its own identity, it has its own leadership structure, it has its, its own organization, its own budget, its own mission statement. Um, that's one way to do things. There, there's another way, and that other way looks something like this, that um, as we go to plant churches, um, you plant under one umbrella, one mission, one leadership structure, one organization, one identity, several congregations. We already have this. It's just happening already. Many of you know we have a daughter church in Lake Worth. The name of that church is Sunlight Community Church. We also now have a new daughter church uh, of Spanish speaking. It's called Sunlight Espanol. We all share one leadership structure, one organization, one mission. Um, that's, I, I think... There's a lot of advantages to that, and as we look to doing that moving forward, instead of all having different missions, all going in different directions, we all want to be going the same way together. Uh, a couple of thoughts as we think about this. Um, you know, just because I think as we're sitting here, well, well, can we do this kind of thing? Is that something that we could possibly accomplish? I just want to show you uh, our membership over the last few years. In 2013, our total membership was 452. Uh, at the end of 2014, it was 587. At the end of last year, it's 736. Now, I don't know, and we don't know who, who God's going to bring and whether this is going to continue, but there's a lot of reasons to think we'll continue to bring new people into the life of our ministry. Uh, I think this is something that I put here just because it's worth celebrating. Do you know that our church last year baptized 74 people uh, into the Christian faith, which I think is just, I mean, it's tremendous. It's phenomenal. It's part of who God's bringing here so that they can be sent out. Uh, there's a lot of incubators for ministry and growth. One of them is our young adult ministry. Over the course of the last couple of years, uh, this group has started, and I think really will become an incubator and a life for, for a new church. Uh, our school, every year, we, we celebrated last year, the, the anniversary. We have some 200 families that get connected to us each year because of the ministry of our school. Vacation Bible School, what a bridge to our community. This last year, we, we served over 500 kids in attendance through our Vacation Bible School, our Fall Festival. If you were here, you know the kind of crowd we had, over 2,500 people present. Um, those are all great bridges to the community. And um, what I want to say is, yeah, we have the possibility of doing this kind of thing. Getting down to kind of like bottom line, brass tacks, detail kind of things. Um, I, I'm going to say this. Part of my reason for saying it is thank you, and then a challenge at the end. Our budget last year, our total budget was just over 900000 In actuality, because of the generosity of people here, 
we actually had uh, just over a million dollars that uh, came into the life of this church. Uh, that's unbelievable, especially, uh, I think some of you know this, As we got to December of last year, we were actually behind what was budgeted. And um, man, I'm just so proud that there are, there are hearts here that say, we can do this, let's go. God's given us the resources. I think this movement of generosity is unbelievable. Um, even more impressive is this. In 2014, the actual dollars were 835. In 2015, a 22% increase. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, the, now the, come on, we, we can do this. Uh, next step, uh, our 2016 budget, our, our council ha has set a new budget of just over $1.1 million, which uh, will be just a 13% increase. And uh, we think this is a kind of doable thing. We're growing, uh, we're giving in increasing ways. Uh, this is something that we can do, and, and here's what I'm excited about. This year, we built it into our budget for the first time, this goal, that 10%, one out of every $10, is going to be set aside. Not for our general fund, not for whatever, but specifically for church planting. And uh, we're doing that here in, in our central campus. Um, we have set that into our budget this year. So, you know, at the end of next year, we'll have over $100,000 ready to go for planting a church. And by the way, we've set that goal on our other two campuses as well. In Sunlight Lake Worth and Sunlight Espanol, they're both working toward this goal also. So as we do this kind of thing, there should be a multiplying effect as we go along. Um, all right, so, you know, we can do it. Come on, let's go. But, but, I, I wanna come back to the, the point. I don't mean we can do it, let's go, because we have it inside of ourselves. I mean, come on, let's do it, let's go, because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Oh, we don't have what it takes, but we have a power from Jesus that can fuel us. He's given us a mission, a ministry, a calling in this place, in this mission field, in this community, and he's with us. Um, let's charge forward. Let's, let's do it. Uh, a couple of things that, they're details, but important. First, leadership. Because now we're already three churches under one umbrella. Um, we've had to make some changes to our leadership structure. Uh, we, we need a, a leadership structure over the whole thing, and then we need local leadership. So our council at the end of last year, what they did is they appointed a, a group that is going to serve as the council overseeing the whole ministry. This is a group of, of high, highly qualified people who have a lot of experience, a, a love and a passion for Jesus. And uh, in just a moment, I'm going to welcome them to the stage because I, I want to ask that as a church we pray for them. But we'll also have, have a need at, at a local leadership level. So our, our council is going to continue as we move toward a new reality. But in upcoming weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, putting together here at this campus a local leadership team. And uh, we really have an eye toward making sure that those who serve in local leadership are, are biblically qualified, they're mature Christians who have deep Christian character and a passion for ministry. And... Uh, our goal really is to raise up, I mean, hundreds of people who, who qualify as elders and deacons because we don't only really need that here, but as we send people out, we don't want to just send anyone. We want to send some people who are biblically trained and qualified. And so as I talk about that, if that's something that you're interested in, I'd like to just have you consider praying about your place in, in this plan and, and its future. Um, that's a local leadership team. Uh, a couple of other just details. I'd like to invite to the stage those who are going to serve as the council. And uh, those people are Jay Smith and Jason Palm and Jesus Bayona and Stan Workman. And the final person is Chris Voss, who is the pastor of our daughter church in Lake Worth. And because they have services in Lake Worth this morning, he can't be here. But um, they're coming to the stage. These are people who, um, yeah. Our council appointed have a calling and gifts to serve in ministry, uh, have many of them served in ministry in a number of different capacities, even as pastors of, of churches, and so we're really blessed. 
A uh, couple of other things just quickly. Um, in years past, as we've had Sunlight Sundays, we've often asked people to respond by, by like, voting for our budget. Here's what's happened. Uh, it's been great. Almost out every year, we have nearly unanimous vote. We, we tend to get like one or two no votes, and we scratch our head about those. And um, what we've said to ourselves is we really want more feedback than that. Even people who are voting yes might have some input beyond just yes, and those who are voting no, boy, we'd like to know what you're thinking. Uh, as we're kind of getting into these new realities, um, on the information booth, on your way out, there's a, a response card. And we need your feedback, we need your cooperation, you need your communication. If there's anything, whether it has to do with budget, or, or vision, or direction, or, or how you can play a role, or things that we ought to look out for, we'd love for you to put your name on this and uh, fill it out. We'd love to hear your feedback. And so, as a way of responding this year, we're asking everyone, let's join hands together. But please, as we do so, uh, if you have something that you'd like to say, or, or something you'd like to communicate at the information desk. Also, uh, all, all of these leaders are going to be there to answer any questions about uh, anything, from tiny details like budget numbers to big picture, like, hey, what's this vision all about? Uh, they'll be there to answer questions. Um, having said all that, I I'd like to just return to a very simple thing. We do not have what it takes in here. We need that power from Jesus, his power, his authority, his presence. And, um, you know, after the first service, uh, just several people came up to me and talked about the circumstances of life, illnesses. Uh, others talked to me about just being beat up. Um, and I, I'm guessing that in a group this size, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, we have to admit, we're spiritually poor. We need God's power. So we're gonna pray for that because God's raising up his church and we're a family. But at the same time, I'd like to ask that you join me in prayer as we lift our hearts up to God to pray for these individuals standing behind me. Uh, there are also people who would quickly admit, I don't have what it takes. I, I need that power and I'd like to just ask that you extend your hearts and, and lift them up in prayer as well. And so let's conclude uh, together by lifting our hearts in prayer.